Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Neelal Shivsagar, and as a vice president of the Asiatic Society of Mumbai and chairperson of the Endowment Lectures Committee, it is my privilege to welcome you here this evening to the very first of our online endowment lectures, the 27th Bansi Seth Memorial Lecture, One Nation Under the Constitution, to be delivered by Mr. Justice Gautam Patel, sitting judge of the Bombay High Court, and presided by senior advocate, Mr. Navro Sirvai, practicing at the Bombay High Court. We are indeed honored that both of them have agreed so readily to grace this occasion. Thank you, sir. I shall, I shall now tell you a little about this memorial lecture that was established in 1992. It was set up in the memory of Srimati Banshi Set, a former honorary secretary of the Asiatic Society, by her husband, Dr. Kirti Shed. I can see that both he and Mrs. Uma Shed are with us on screen this evening. We are happy that you can join us on this occasion. So, uh, Srimati Banshi Set Ne Kazi was born in Bombay. She went to Elphinstone College and did her LLB from Government Law College. In the late 1950s and early 60s, she taught law at the Siddharth College of Law, besides embarking on a career of independent practice on the original side of the Bombay High Court. Srimati Banshi said, inherited an affinity to law from her mother's side. Her mother's grandfather, Mr. Justice Nanabai Haridas, was the first Indian to be appointed a judge of the Bombay High Court. Her maternal grandfather, Sri Jamiyat Ram Bhakti, was a practicing advocate of the Bombay High Court and but for his premature demise, would have succeeded to judgeship of the Bombay High Court like his illustrious father. Bansi Bell went to the U.S. in 1965 and obtained her M.A. in English Literature and Business Administration. She won the prestigious fellowship of the Council of International Progress in Management, sponsored and supported by leading corporations. Upon her return to India in 1969, she took up independent consultancy in business management and legal work for leading companies. This finally led her to join the well-known firm of Tayagi Dayabai. At the time of her demise, she was a partner in the firm. Bansi Ben joined the Asiatic Society as a member in 1949. And later, she was a member of the managing committee from 1971 to 72. Subsequently, she was appointed Joint Honorary Finance Secretary from June 72 to 75. And after that, she was elected Honorary Secretary of the Society five times. So from a decade, for a decade, from 1975 to 1985. She had the distinction of being the first woman to hold this position. Bansi Ben passed away in 1991 following a heart attack. Thereafter, her husband, Dr. Kirti Sheikh, donated a munificent sum to hold an annual lecture on a subject that was dear to her heart, society and law. The Asiatic Society has held a lecture under this prestigious series since 1992 and respected legal luminaries such as Mr. Soli Sorabdi, Srimati Justice Sujata Manohar and Mr. Justice B. N. Shri Krishna, to name just a few, have been previous speakers. Today, we are honored to have Mr. Justice Gautam Patel to continue this tradition. I would like to tell you a little about him. So he was born in Mumbai in April 1962. Mr. Justice Patel is a graduate of St. Davis College and Government Law College. He started practice in 1987 in Mumbai working on commercial, corporate, and civil litigations, and also appearing in a large number of environmental public interest litigations, including those relating to the Sanjay Gandhi National Park, protection of mangroves, 
town and country planning issues, Melghat National Park, the mill lands, protection of open spaces, etc. In 1994-95, Mr. Justice Patel received the first International Fellowship at Pacific Energy and Resources Center, South Salito, California, in environmental law. This included coursework at the University of Berkeley's Bold Hall School of Law and an internship with the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund. He served as the Honorary Secretary of the Bombay Bar Association for two three-year terms from 1999 to 2005 and served on the association's standing committee till his appointment as a High Court judge. From 2008 to 2011, he was a part-time lecturer in administrative law, constitutional law and environmental law at Government Law College. Mr. Justice Patel has previously served as a trustee on several public charitable trusts and foundations in the fields of education, environment, and the hearing impaired. He has been an active contributor to the public discourse. His wide range of in interests has included being a newspaper columnist and a contributor to the EPW. He has delivered a number of important lectures, for example, a lecture on equitable cities in the memory of Charles Correa in Goa and at the CSMBS Museum on images of Mumbai in the memory of Paul Nissen. So we are proud to have him here today. And I now introduce senior advocate, Mr. Navros Sidwai. He graduated from Elphinstone College and thereafter did his law. He started practice in the Bombay High Court in the chambers of R.J. Joshi and A.M. Sethiwar, specializing in constitutional and administrative law, company and corporate law, and environmental law. He is actively involved in public interest litigation in the field of environmental law and civil liberties and human rights. He has been actively involved in the People's Union for Civil Liberties, PUCL, from 1981 onwards, and in particular, the Bombay unit of the PUCL, of which he was treasurer and secretary for several years. He has been active in representing some of the important cases by, filed by the PUCL involving the human rights and civil liberties of pavement dwellers under trials, condition of women prisoners, etc and also the Bombay Environmental Action Group from 1981 onwards. I am happy to inform you that currently Mr. Sirwai is a trustee of the Asiatic Society of Mumbai. I now hand over the proceedings to you Mr. Sirwai. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Sorry, can I be heard? Yes. Uh, yes Mr. Shri Sagar, uh, Justice Patel, uh, and members of the audience, uh, I'm not only delighted, uh, but really feel honored uh, to preside uh, at this function. Uh, and uh, to very briefly say a few words in addition to what has already been said uh, about Justice Patel. Um, I think if there's one thing that makes Justice Patel stand out amongst all others, it's his vast yet deep and eclectic interests and tastes. Uh, he is a voracious reader of books, magazines, articles, and there are very few subjects of which one could say that Justice Patel knows nothing or very little. His style of writing is inimitable and he certainly brought uh, a 
great deal of elah and joie de vivre uh, when he was elevated uh, on the bench uh, and to read his judgments not just uh, for their uh, depth of knowledge in law their precision and their focus uh, and brevity uh, but for the sheer pleasure of the language used uh, is a treat which we as lawyers in the bombay high court have had for the last 8 years or so um, at a personal level uh, justice patel and i went to the same school uh, we then lost touch for a while uh, only to regain it uh, at the bar uh, i have been actively associated with him uh, at the bar uh in environmental and other matters as well and uh i had the uh, occasion i had an occasion had occasions and the privilege i should say uh being slightly senior to him uh to have settled some of his drafts uh and i always thought to myself that it was the easiest task because there was really nothing to settle it was just a pleasure to read uh the way he drafted uh i think uh you are as keen as i am uh, to your justice patel i do believe that we are in uh, for an intellectual treat and with uh with this i i would request and call upon justice patel uh, to deliver uh, uh, his lecture uh, under the auspices of the banshee sheikh memorial lecture uh, justice patel if i may now call upon you to address the audience uh i think he needs to be unmuted excuse me excuse me that's uh, i think i think we're yeah ah there there we are uh many thanks to both of you uh especially mr sirvai i think he is completely wrong there are many things i don't know i may be just exceptionally good at covering up my ignorance it is a special privilege to be here this address would and should have been delivered in march 2020 but events have overtaken us this medium is by no means an adequate substitute i cannot see you or greet you but perhaps it does have one very great advantage like lewis carroll's legendary snark you can softly and suddenly vanish away and i will be none the wiser neither will the asiatic society so your membership is safe february 2020 a cool and quiet late afternoon the court's work done for the day i was told the high court's chief librarian dr uma narayan wanted to meet me she is accomplished learned two phd's already and dragging her feet on a third always cheerful but she also has quite temper as i have over time discovered to my consternation it is therefore generally not a good idea to say no to her so i took the safer option and welcomed her did i want a portrait of one of our judges in my court room she asked it was in the museum and there was no place for it there nor in any of the other court halls the court room in which it used to hang was being renovated and the portrait had been taken down and restored yes of course i said can be in my court until we return it to its original location but whose portrait is it i asked mr justice nana bai haridas she said with her unshakable confidence in her own undeniability she had already had the portrait carted up three floors and moments later it was solemnly installed on a credenza opposite my desk it's a wonderful portrait the judge in red ermine with a black stole and cape judge's bands of fine white lace 
a red turban looking off to his right he has a silvery mustache his eyes are bright and sharp born in surat in september 1832 nanabai haridas began his career as a translator in government service in 1852 studied law at elphinstone institute translated indian laws of the time into gujarati for the government and began his law practice in 1857 now between 1873 and 1884 haridas acted as a temporary judge of the bombay high court as many as nine times there was only one other indian acting judge before him in the intervals between his stints on the bench he continued his law practice and taught law thus swinging from bar to bench and back again for an all time record of 11 years finally in 1884 he was confirmed as the first indian permanent judge of the bombay high court a position he held until his death in 1889 he was widely held to be an authority on hindu law it surely must have been an odd time for him his name is the 23rd in the list of judges of the bombay high court since it was first established barring the other additional indian judge vasudev ji all the others were english one can only wonder how this surat born gujarati man did not feel utterly isolated but perhaps those were purer times the reason for my delight in this happenstance with the portrait was that just a short while earlier i had accepted the asiatic society's invitation to deliver the bansri shri memorial lecture for as it turns out and as you have just heard nanabai haridas was bansri shri's maternal grandfather his portrait is now in my chamber but other links and connections stretch back in time she was a student at government law college my own alma mater and later as you have heard she was a partner of mrs tab ji dhabai a very old and renowned firm of solicitors well known to many lawyers and judges and to me and my family personally bansri shet joined the society in 1949 and was an office bearer for 14 years in july 76 while she was the honorary secretary of the society there was a first ever three day five session meeting of a special joint committee set up by the central and state governments among those present were in yet another coincidence mr d m suktankar well known in this city and again to us personally he was then the secretary of the department of education the record of those proceedings available on google books is an intriguing and engaging reflection of the times even then there existed many of the problems and issues we see today despite a strong structure to the fabulous society building years of neglect and decay inadequate shelving dumped volumes damaged material of the priceless collection lack of financing and so on had all taken their toll on the second day the committee described as a most unholy wedlock the combining of the asiatic society with the state central library the more it changes the more it stays the same and so the strands of time unravel and bring us together here this evening one of the most active perhaps the most active filing sections of the high court and possibly any constitutional court is the writ section at the high court level the petitions filed here invoke the high prerogative remedies under articles 226 or 227 of the constitution of india typically these petitions open with the proclamation that the individual petitioner is two things a citizen of india and an indian national the first is immediately understandable for many of our fundamental rights are citizen specific but what of the second what is this business of being an indian national it does not speak to 
or only to being born in India or holding an Indian passport. Those are incidents or dimensions of citizenship. I do not propose to discuss this evening the arguably more mundane concept of nationality. Instead, I look to the word nation, not for itself, but for its implications on another term that is of very great contemporary relevance, nationalism. In this lecture, I will present the argument that our concept of nationalism has suffered great distortions, most especially in recent times. This may even be deliberate for, as we shall see, the conscious narrowing of the term's dimensions has severe political, social, and constitutional repercussions. I will argue that nationalism is above all two things. First, a matter of identity at both the individual and societal level. And second, that it is an essential constitutional construct, perhaps the most essential constitutional construct, besides which other terms, patriotism, pluralism, ethnicity, race, and religion, and perhaps even the pseudo-secularism bandied about today are largely irrelevant. This last needs a word of explanation. Secularism in its truest form is emphatically not about a peaceful coexistence. That is certainly irrelevant. Secularism in its proper form should and must mean religion, any and every religion, in its place at a deeply personal and only at a personal level. The ascendance of these alternatives, especially religion, and warped ideas of secularism and pluralism inevitably results in an undermining of a key constitutional component and thus threatens the structure of the Republic. The word nation is a descendant of the word nation in Old French, meaning birth or nascence. And this in turn is derived from the Latin natio, literally birth. Over time, it has melded into both geography and politics. Black's Law Dictionary speaks of it as a political entity of a large group of people with a common origin, language, and tradition. We will bear that in mind, common. The dictionary goes on. When this definition coincides with the political state, we have the expression nation state and consequently a community of people inhabiting a defined territory and organized under an independent government, a sovereign political state. It can therefore also mean just a country, the Indian nation, or for that matter, the United Nations. At its simplest level, therefore, nationalism is an identification by the individual with the large community that comprises the nation. It manifests itself sometimes as a support for the nation state's interests and in its more virulent form to the detriment, derision or exclusion of all other nations. At a social level, it sometimes takes on hues of jingoism, the sense that one's nation is always the superior one. The core of nationalism is both self-determination and self-governance. Historically, notions of nationalism were crucial in ending colonial rule, and the term is therefore positioned in opposition to both colonialism and in imperialism. In Europe, it took another form, the overthrow of monarchies, often despotic, almost certainly dynastic, by democratic republics. Focused as we are today on our independent struggle, we have perhaps failed in India to understand this societal transformation in Europe. Kinship, shared traditions, and shared territories are also all early forms of nationalism 
although the term only gained currency in the 18th century. At least one school of thought emphasizes semiotics as a historical antecedent of nationalism, shared symbols, especially religious symbols, mythologies and traditions, again, especially religious ones, in the growth of nationalism. A more contemporary view is that nationalism as we understand it today is far more complex and deals with social, economic and political structures essential to the existence of modern society governed by one overarching commonality, the rule of law and in particular, the rule of constitutional law. Two key concepts define modern nationalism, unity or unification and identity. These are not easily segregated. Outward manifestations of modern nationalism are familiar. National flags, anthems, symbols, logos, myths, and indigenous animals. These are all what I call tokens or icons of nationalism, and they serve that precise purpose of the definition itself as keys or clues to unity and identity. Viewed like this, we begin to see the oddest things in history. Nationalism of one stripe was responsible for the rise of Nazi Germany and nationalism of another for the Zionist movement that led to the creation of the state of Israel. I use that illustration only for its obvious starkness. This lets us focus on these two ideas of unity and identity as crucial components of nationalism. We now set these in a certain framework, namely the constitution. Now, constitutionalism is a separate lecture in itself. It has its own complex roots, including the work of Locke, Hobbes, Rousseau, and others, and people everywhere continue to struggle with its meaning. For today, let us accept this, almost certainly oversimplified and perhaps even simplistic, that constitutionalism is first the historical progression of a people, again, concepts of unity and identity, for self-determination, that is to say, for defining the legal standards by which they choose to be governed. It defines their rights, duties, and privileges. This is largely descriptive, being historical. Second, and equally important, it is a prescriptive, ongoing process of evolving mechanisms to limit the powers and reach of government, a check on government arbitrariness in administration. The debate on constitutionalism is, of course, much more complex and nuanced than this. But for my purposes this evening, it will do. Descriptive constitutionalism as self-determination and a collective decision to be bound by a defined code. And prescriptive constitutionalism to act as an all-important check on government excess. With that as a keystone value, let me return to the changing perceptions of nationalism set against its two crucial components of unity and identity. 73 years ago at independence, and it is perhaps fitting that this is being said just a few days past August 15th, it seems unlikely that there was any divergence between nationalism and identity. The two merged in simply being Indian, as Ramala Thapar says at the start of her essay in the volume on nationalism. Siddharth Luthra and Nivedita Mukhija say this in a 2018 paper on nationalism and constitutional responses. In India, nationalism was once synonymous with the freedom struggle. For a colonized people, for whom unity was needed to weave together different peoples and regions with diverse cultures, 
to obtain freedom from British rule, nationalism was a liberating force, a promise of equality and freedom from colonial subjugation. This spirit of nationalism was rooted in ideas of progress and development, not only politically, but also socially, economically, and culturally. On the one hand, it was accompanied with a revival of religion, culture, languages, art, and more. And on the other hand, there was development of a scientific spirit and modern ideas. In the third essay in the On Nationalization volume, Sadanan Menon says this, what is visible today is a new hatred for the idea of democracy as we know it and for the rights as guaranteed in the Constitution. This is quite in keeping with the agenda of cultural nationalism, which strives through generating a climate of intolerance and intimidation to keep civil society in a state of constant agitation by subjecting it to constant attack. Cultural nationalism, by any definition, is a rogue version of nationalism which is already present in the concepts of the nation state. He explains this to mean a systematic ejectment of political rights in debate and the substitution of these with usually four ideas of shared cultural rights. This, Menon says, is not just irrational, but occupies a space of imaginary hurt, insults, wounds and defeat inflicted by imaginary enemies who always belong to religions and regions not you believe are your own. History is to these cultural revanchists a source of immense worry. Why? The answer to this lies in what, as Menon points out, Salman Rushdie described as mongrelization precisely the lack of any cultural, religious, or linguistic unity in a country like ours. This is bound to be deeply unsettling. For if you cannot claim affinity or membership of a well-defined cultural, religious, or linguistic group, then who exactly are you? And whose country is it anyway? Whose nation? Luthra and Mukija again. There are groups that advocate a relook at history, culture, and education. They believe that India should be defined not in Western liberal terms, but in what are termed as ancient civilizational values. The contention is that India must be synonymous with the majority traditions, and a thousand years of invasions and invaders cannot be the basis to define this ancient land and its people. Historically, nationalism as an ideology has used othering as a way to identify the nation, but in doing so has however necessitated the presence of an other to maintain such an identity distinction. At least part of this dissatisfaction has to do with the way we have administered justice in this country over the past 70 odd years, or more accurately, failed to administer it. I do not mean only the verdicts and decisions of the law courts. There are enough examples of many that were patently and blatantly unjust, and there seems at least of late little dimming or stemming of that tide. We hold a collective responsibility for each of those for very often what a judge says in a decision is determined by intangible and ephemeral forces, including political leanings, social attitudes, exposure to the world's working, reading, education, and even travel. Judges are, after all, human and subject to all the inherent frailties and failures of that condition. But that is not the limit of the injustice. 
in almost every aspect, India's trajectory as a society has been a remarkable march away from becoming more civilized, more even, more just. Disparities in income, opportunity, lifestyle, environmental rights, and legal rights have not narrowed. The poor are poorer, the rich very much richer, and nowhere is this more apparent than within our cities and in the contrast, as the journalist P. Sainath has spent a lifetime pointing out, between our cities and our villages. To equate private wealth growth with development and progress is just flat out wrong. In unemployment, particularly urban unemployment, is a hugely disruptive force. We have common experience of this. Young men and women with degrees unable to find suitable jobs and winding up taking whatever work they can, even as delivery persons, and that awful word we use in this country, peons. The impact of this is to tear at the fabric of civil society. It creates a rootlessness, a sense of being marooned, a sense of not belonging. The concepts of nation and nationhood are now abstraction. They lack the necessary immediacy and continuity. Witness, therefore, the rise of smaller and more aggressive units, such as in Mumbai, the Shivasena Shaka, I do not mean the political party itself, but for want of a better word, one of its ground level organizational units. The reason this works so very well is precisely because it provides to the rootless a sense of belonging and of identity. Once you are part of the Shaka or some other similar group governed by another party, you gain an identity and that identity then dictates what you do and how you go about doing it. It is then perfectly legitimate to question or even openly defy the rule of law and constitutional wrong, norms. Those are now entirely alien to your identity and they provide no unity. From this there follows a natural expansion to notions in larger groups of racial purity, an embalmed monolithic history and most easily accessible of all, a religious singularity. This then makes it entirely legitimate and possible to advance the cause of rewriting swaths of history and promoting unsubstantiated claims to superiority and of saying, for instance, that we were there first before the rest of the world. This translates into familiar norms at the retail or individual level, shrill jingoism and an utterly false use of patriotism. And at the level of the government of the, of the day, a stifling of criticism by, among other things, using the law on sedition. Whatever the form, the intent is to create and silence this other, the same expression, we just saw in Luthra and Mukija's work. This use of othering in the formation of nationalist sentiments needs attention. Othering, Professor John Evans of Portland State University writes, is the process in which groups or their individuals are defined by the social majority as different, incompatible, unworthy, or otherwise unwanted or ostracized. This act results in the dichotomist formation of an us group and a them group, or in some places an in group and an out group. This exclusion is usually based on some external identifier such as ethnicity, nationality, gender, accent, etc. The extremity of this exclusion can range from ignoring students of other nationalities to committing genocide. It is a process more serious than individual xenophobia. 
othering is a process that begins in institutions of power and filters down to the people. Indeed, it is a corporate xenophobia imposed upon the people of the nation through political rhetoric, the media, national historiography, and perpetuated through socialization. The process of othering serves two purposes. A, it serves to construct the self-identity of the nation, and B, it provides a scapegoat to the nation for its present and past troubles. The coincidence or conflation of this strident jingoism or false patriotism and the ascendance of evil is equally evident. A brilliant exposition is in James Waller's 2002 work, Becoming Evil, How Ordinary People Commit Genocide and Mass Killing. He sets out four factors that lead people to commit acts of quite extraordinary evil. The third of these is the immediate social milieu and how this translates to a culture of cruelty. What brings individuals together in a group, how these groups as functional units dictate to the individual members, thus providing the individual with a sense of identity and the group as a whole with a unity of purpose. The fourth ingredient is precisely that of which Evans speak, the othering, us versus them, the leveling of blame for imaginary wrongs past and present and the resultant dehumanization. We know therefore when on television we are being hectored that the nation wants to know that this is nothing but a process of othering. Who or what exactly is this nation? Is it the one under the constitution? Or is it something the TV channel drummed up for this evening? Usually from this point, it is all downhill. There follows the inevitable invocation of being anti-national if one does not agree, and then rising to a crescendo and an accusation of a lack of patriotism. Of course, this is populism. And as Tom Ginsburg and Aziz Haq say in How to Save a Constitutional Democracy, populism is democracy's dysfunctional cousin, one lacking the moral appeal and long-term stability of a healthy democracy. Ginsburg and Huck point out that populists expand precisely this othering by contending that they and they alone represent the people. All other electoral or policy options are illegitimate or futile or both. This concept of the people, they show, is non-institutionalized. There is an assertion of a singularity, religious, moral, political, not voiced in a more formal way, say, in a written constitution. An ordinary democratic process depends on two or three distinct things, questioning, deferring or dissenting, and an institutionalized system of checks on excess. Populism rejects all three as being entirely illegitimate and sees all three as anti-national. This is a direct path to accusations of being a traitor. As Ginsburg and Huck put it, in its paradoxical appeal to and simultaneous attack upon democratic practice, populism exploits and amplifies basic dilemmas of liberal constitutional democracy. Democracy is difficult, slow, and messy. Populism, for this reason, sees it as weak and effete, and therefore seeks to erode, among other things, constitutional institutions, especially those meant to curb government and fundamental rights. Populism uproots the rule of law. Consider these words from Ginsburg and Huck and see how apt they are to us today. Elections become corrupted and dysfunctional when they cease to have a meaningful relationship to the actual behavior of officials in office. 
In many cases, elections turn on voters' emotional affiliation with a particular politician rather than any judgment about the politician's expected efficacy. Such elections are hardly the democratic ideal. For elections to serve their proper function, there is a need for a continuous flow of reasonably accurate information about the interaction between government policies and external conditions. At some point, information failures can become so extensive and asymmetrically tilted in favor of one coalition or candidate that they render the exercise of democratic choice futile. If this sounds familiar, it should. At the level of the government, othering takes much more sinister forms. Typically, the arrest and continued incarceration of persons accused of being anti-national, whether under the existing law and sedition or one or the other of the so-called terrorism statutes. In the second essay in the Unnationalism volume, A.G. Nurani has an exceptionally fine essay in which he dissects the law on sedition in this country. There is also a superb filleting of the 1962 Kedar Singh case. He writes, bar a perfunctory reference to Justice Sastri's observation that was in Ramesh Thapar versus State of Mad Madras, to the effect that sedition had been deliberately omitted after debate in the constitution. There was no discussion of the process by which the framers of the constitution chose deliberately to omit sedition. No reference to the press commission's recommendation. And worst of all, no reference to the full bench ruling of the Allahabad High Court in Ramnandan versus State or to Nehru's speech in 1951 denouncing sedition amid copious quotes from old, obsolete English rulings. An undergraduate whose essay on sedition contained blemishes such as these, Nurani says, would earn a deserved reprimand. Instead, Kedarnath passed muster. Its baleful impact, Nurani writes, has survived to poison the wells of free speech. Now this is crucial and brings us back to our starting premise that an important facet of constitutional nationalism is the interagency check on abuse of power, specifically the power of judicial review vested in courts, a power necessary for stable, open and good governance, one not based on religion, regional, linguistic, or other identity, but something more fundamental. This is Dr. Ramila Thapar in a 2016 interview in Caravan magazine. Surely nationalism requires a serious commitment to a nation defined as every citizen having access to human rights and recognized not just by territory, but also by reliable and just governance. Nationalism is not expressed merely by raising a flag or shouting a slogan, but by safeguarding rights and ensuring good governance. If you take a map of India and fling three darts at it, you are unlikely to find commonality of culture, religion or language between the three landing points. Even within any region, there is wide diversity of faith, belief, practice, culture, art, language, food, all the rest of it. A unification of these people by seeking common ground is impossible. And this is precisely why we see the ascendance of othering and unseating of nationalism as a constitutional ideal and an attempt to enthrone some other commonality. Of these, the brute force majoritarianism of religion is perhaps the most effective. It succeeds precisely because it is easy to create a definable other, and within that other, there is no need for nuance. There is a growing swell of support for the utterly false notion, for instance, 
that there once existed in ancient Indian history a unified Hindu nation with a homogenous religious commonality. This othering succeeds in one or more of at least three ways, exile, as for example, Buddhism, smothering, I think assimilation is too kind a of word, that robs the other of all identity, as in bhakti, or a more visible and open hostile confrontation, outright extermination. I need not explain this last. The more fundamental problem with this approach is that it eliminates nuance and complexity in history and compresses it into a steady, predictable and easily comprehensible stream of neat chronological events. But history is not straightforward. It is not easy. Like democracy, one of history's products, it is untidy, disordered, and difficult to decipher with all its many strands, conflicting versions, and most of all, rival narratives. History is the test of credibility of these rival narratives. This view of history and what its study demands parallels to a great extent the practice of law. In both disciplines, we take the facts as we find them. In both, there are competing and conflicting narratives to be untangled. In both, the goal is to reach a probabilistic approximation what is most likely to have happened. Neither is a quest for a single absolute truth. Both acknowledge that there is simply no such thing. Both deal with this thing we call evidence, and this evidence in both disciplines takes similar forms, texts, images, oral accounts. Much, perhaps all of it, has to do with human memory. After all, writing is the physical rendering of memory. This, from our Evidence Act of 1872, is telling the statutory definitions of proved, disproved, and not proved. I will take just one. A fact is said to be proved when, after considering the matters before it, the court either believes it to exist or considers its existence so probable that a prudent man ought, under the circumstances of the particular case, to act upon the supposition that it exists. Note these words, believes, probable, prudent, circumstances, supposition. Therefore, not an absolute or unified truth, but that one that was probable or likely, with the distinct possibility of there being an equally valid other. Consequently, the process of the study of history parallels judicial inquiry and vice versa. This is dialectics, viewing multiple perspectives to arrive at the most reasonable reconciliation of apparently contradictory information and data or interpreting opposites, negating the negation, thesis and antithesis, and the tension between these two. The labels, Marxist, Hegelian, Socratic, Plato, matter little or not at all. What is of relevance is the ultimate goal, a probabilistic likely result. This view of history, and religion is very much embedded in history, is clearly uncomfortable to the religious right. Religious majoritarianism demands a flattening of contradictions and the establishment of an identifiable singularity. Complexity invokes doubt, dissent, argument, opposition, and plurality that unseats religious majoritarianism and defeats the intention of religion-based nationalism. The answer to this, of course, is the gross oversimplification of laying claim to a historical religious unity and identity 
and discarding by this process of flattening and othering that we have seen all discourse that legitimately points to the contrary. Self-evidently, therefore, this flattening is as illegitimate a process in the study of history as it would be in the practice of law. Secularism, often cited in response, provides no alternative to majoritarian demands for religious identity and unity. True secularism, that is to say the entire separation of church and state and the view of religion in its place, demands the precise opposite of religious unification. The acceptance of a wholly amorphous condition without cleanly defined leaders, boundaries, or definitions. This is the potent attraction of religious unification, and it is going to be an extremely difficult task to unseat it in favor of something altogether more ambiguous. A few days ago, Sagarika Ghosh wrote this. The secular, non-secular binary keeps us forever trapped in religious identities, which is what politicians want. When the urgent need is for citizens to demand that religion become immaterial to governance. Instead of reflexively thinking of ourselves only as Hindus or Muslims or Christians or other religions, we can define ourselves as 21st century liberal Democrats who demand a modern government insulated from all religion with no special benefits to any one group. Utopian, yes, but worth aspiring for. A few days earlier, Pratap Bhanu Mehta had an insightful column in the Indian Express. The idea that taking religion seriously as a political matter will solve the communal problem is a historically dubious proposition. Modern religious politics is born in the crucible of democracy and nationalism, not theology. We do not need another version of what it means to be a good Hindu. Who can be presumptuous enough to define or benchmark that? What we need is a genuine commitment to freedom with all its risks, self-doubts, and fashioning and refashioning of identities. The deeper question is the growing tolerance for prejudice and the unleashing of a ferocious darkness. Let us name the beast for what it is and not hide behind the pieties of secularism or religion. Recovering the project will not mean a return to religion, but a confidence in the promise of a new freedom struggle to salvage individual dignity and rights, not continually play out resentments against the other. That word again. Who then? is an Indian national, that petitioner before our writ courts. What does it mean to be an Indian in this republic? In light of recent events, are the owners and operators of the very many Chinese food restaurants in this country Indian or are they not? Born and raised here, they speak our language or one of our tongues. And I will consider the language of Mumbai, of this city, as a distinct language, for I have no doubt that every one of these persons can curse in a meld of Hindi, Marathi, and Gujarati as fluently as anyone else on the streets, but probably not in Mandarin or Cantonese. Would we today segregate them as being anti-national and deny to them the identity they have had from birth as Indians? Are they to be othered? Would this pass muster today as constitutional? Protection of civil rights against state excess, state neutrality, the persistent dominion of the rule of constitutional law, these, I would argue, are the permanent, everlasting, and perennial elements of constitutional nationalism. They cannot be redacted, and there can be no other constituent of Indian nationalism. 
To keep these truths, there is one thing we need above all, dissent. Without dissent, democracy dies. The process of democracy is evolutionary and it evolves by a constant business of looking askance, questioning, doubting, and suggesting change. There is a long tradition of dissent in recorded Indian history, and we have it too from ancient Roman and Greek times. If you do want to put a religious twist on it, there's biblical precedent too, and it takes a form familiar to all lawyers today. Hear the other side. On its own, this eviscerates any notion of the legitimacy of religious majoritarianism. Ramin Jahambeglu in The Decline of Civilization has this to say, it is the courage of dissent as a process of self-realization and autonomous thinking that is lacking today. This is what de-civilization is, a society lacking the capacity and culture for producing dissenting individuals. The lack of courage to criticize our meaningless existence has become the defining trait of our society. And this is accompanied by a rejection and ignorance of the past as the final blow to the idea of civilization. Finally, and this is why the auspices of this particular lecture carries a particular pathos. Central to the process of dissent and progress, and therefore to a thinking, thoughtful, democratic republic, is that one truly universal, unifying symbol of the ascent of human civilization, the library. Great cities in history were known for their libraries. The ancient cities of Ebla, probably the oldest known around 2500 BC, and Ugarit in Syria, Nineveh in Iraq, Alexandria, Rome, Constantinople, Takshashila, Nalanda, all had vast libraries. The Asiatic library is a place of refuge and reflection in a tempestuous city. Its collection has some gems. I believe one of only two known copies of Dante's Inferno, a 1623 first folio of Shakespeare, and Firdosi's Shahanama, among others. Libraries everywhere are bound to memory, language, and communication, but perhaps most of all, to a need for information and retrieval of that information. Human beings are perhaps the only creatures who store information outside themselves. In a stunning passage in An Alchemy of the Mind, Diane Ackerman writes, but the skull can only swell so much and still pass through the birth canal. Even after the human brain folded in, under and around itself, it still needed to add important skills. The only solution was to drop some abilities to make room for more important ones. No doubt fascinating gifts were passed up or lost. The best survival trick was language, one worth sacrificing large amounts of trunk space for. What the brain really needed was space without volume. So it took a radical leap and did something unparalleled in the history of life on earth. It began storing information and memories outside itself on stone, papyrus, paper, computer chips, and film. This astonishing feat is so familiar a part of our lives that we do not think much about it. But it was an amazing and rather strange solution to what was essentially a packing problem. Just store your essentials elsewhere and avoid cluttering up the cave. Thus, the library. But libraries are more than mere collections. They are homes for opposing or contrary thoughts, ideas, and views that are dangerous to and feared by populists and despots everywhere and to every form of majoritarianism. 
they and universities which have libraries are crucibles of dissent, repositories of views of every kind. Every republic needs space for dissent, disagreement and discussion, a place for a fair and unbiased study of the past, a place where anyone may read and access anything by anyone else. This is the thinking republic, the only kind worth having. What every such republic needs is libraries. Our identity as a people is not, therefore, defined by a majoritarian view or the assertion of one homogenized religion or culture or history. It is defined by the precise opposite that we have no such singularity. The only identity we have is to be Indian in this republic, complete with conflicts forever unresolved, contradictions never answered. And the only unity to which we can hew without risking any othering is our constitution. When asked what the Philadelphia Convention produced, Benjamin Franklin is supposed to have answered a republic, if you can keep it. Can we? Or will we stand mute witness to the dismantling of our republic? Thank you for listening. Ladies and am I audible? Yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's usually cliched to say that one has heard a brilliant lecture even when one has not. Uh, I do believe that it would not be cliched to say it on this occasion. Uh, Justice Patel has just delivered uh, not just a brilliant, but if I may say so, uh, an almost breathtakingly brilliant lecture. In its depth, in its breadth, in all that it has encompassed. You've heard a lecture on law, constitutional law, history, philosophy, politics, and much else. Uh, it's difficult to digest. And uh, I would like to presume that there is a transcript, which in due course of time, uh, the Asiatic will publish. Uh, it will be well worth going back to it and reading it uh, to absorb everything that we've heard in this 55 minute lecture. Justice Patel has dealt with issues that are on the one hand universal, the issues of dissent, the rule of law, constitutionality, and which are burning issues uh, the world over, but certainly in this country, of false patriotism. And it was not for nothing that Samuel Johnson said that patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel, a warped notion of nationalism, and issues of religion versus secularism, and the gnawing by civil society and government at the innards of 
what in 1947 and thereafter in 1950 we dreamed and hoped would be a truly secular republic, one nation of which all Indians could be proud to say that we belong to one nation, namely India. Uh, when one is at a concert and hears a monumental work, there are many, one decries people uh, calling out for an anchor. Uh, mine uh, is uh, an anchor in that sense. Uh, and I, I, I don't think I, I, I want to say more or need to say more. I think all of us need to just sit for a bit and contemplate on what we've just heard. But more importantly, try to assimilate it and um, act according to what we think is the correct and proper way as citizens of one nation under a constitution. Um, I, I don't think I want to say much more except two things. One, I want to thank Justice Patel for this incredible lecture and elucidation on various subjects. Uh, and two, I can't help uh, telling the audience that now you'll understand why when on an occasion that I had to write about Justice Patel, I misquoted uh, Kipling to say that he exemplifies the saying that what does he know of the law who only knows the law. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank Justice Patel, uh, the Asiatic Society, uh, and say good evening to all of you. Uh, so to end this wonderful um, time spent together, I have the pleasure of thanking you, Mr. Justice Patel, for a detailed and thoughtful exposition, and also for emphasizing the role of libraries in human civilization. It has been a delight at many levels to listen to you. We have learned a great deal in the course of this lecture, and of course we are planning to publish it, because we all need time to assimilate all this, and also we think that future generations need to hear this, to read it. Thank you, Mr. Sirvai, for your introduction to Justice Patel, and for your insightful comments. We are grateful to both of you for your time and willingness to be part of our initiative to move this endowment lecture to an online platform. Our grateful thanks as always to Dr. Kirti Sheth for his steadfast support over the last 27 years. And once again, thank you all for being with us.